Good morning, everyone. I'm your moderator for today's webinar. Myself, Sushmita Yen, Director of Alumni Affairs, Pan Pharma Club, Faculty of Pharmacy, MS Ramaya University of Applied Sciences. I'll be here to facilitate the discussion and ensure that everything runs smoothly. I would like to welcome our resource person for today's webinar, Dr. Gaurav Shah, Associate Professor, Department of Biotechnology, Veer Narmad, South Gujarat University. And, and I would also like to welcome you all to this webinar, Living Organism to Cybernetic Organism, Struggle for Existence or Survival Forever. Before we begin, I would like to go over a few things. First, please make sure that your microphones are muted throughout the webinar to avoid any background noise. Secondly, if you have any questions or comment, please type them in a chat box. I will do my best to address them during the QA and portion of the webinar. With that said, I would like to invite Ms. Ashita Gore to give a brief introduction of our speaker. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to everyone who has joined us for this fascinating and enlightening webinar today. We are excited to talk about the interesting subject of living organism to cybernetic organism struggle for existence or survival forever. And we are glad to have you here. Myself, Harshita Gaur, Vice President of Pan PharmaCon Student Club. So before we begin our session, I would like to give a special greeting to our valued resource person, Dr. Gaurav Shah, who has completed his graduation in microbiology from Gujarat University, Ahmedabad, and post-graduation as well as Doctor of Philosophy in Biosciences from Veer Narmad, South Gujarat University, Surat. Gaurav Shah is associate professor and head of department of biotechnology at VNSGU campus Surat. He has written and published total 10 books out of which six books of microbiology as an editor and two books as a sole author, which is student handbook of biotechnology, a dictionary of biotechnology for beginners and the other one fearless practice MCQs in life sciences for preparation of state and national level competitive exams. With around 20, 24 years of teaching and research experience, he has published 44 papers in national and international journals. Till date, five students are awarded PhD degree and one master of philosophy degree under his guidance and four students are working for PhD degree. His active in teaching biofuel technology bioprocess technology, enzyme technology, biotechnology entrepreneurship development, and microbiology technology. His field of specialization is microbial enzyme and pigments, fragmentation technology, nanotechnology, and mushroom biotechnology. Apart from that, he is also a life member of several professional bodies. Now, I wholeheartedly welcome to our resource person, Dr. Gaurav Shah. So let's start the interactive and exciting session and make use of valuable opportunity. Once again, a heartfelt thank you to all of you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ashita. Susmita, madam. Yes, sir. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir, you're audible. So uh, should I share my screen and start? Yes, sir, you can, sir. You can proceed, sir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, is it visible? Yes, sir, it's visible. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Uh, uh, the organizing committee of uh, Ramaya University of Applied Sciences Department of Pharmacology. Uh, I thank all of you for inviting me and I uh, welcome all the participants who are listening to this webinar on living organisms to cybernetic organisms struggle for existence or survival forever. 
the main reason behind selection of this particular topic is rather to make it more thought provoking whatever i am going to present is the compilation of many things which i have gone throughout my academic career being a biologist understanding humans how they evolve and then later on being a microbiologist and heading biotech department in surat gujarat lot many things controversial statements are there regarding our existence regarding our survival we normally compare next generation with the older one and we try to come up to certain conclusion and then interpretation so my presentation the whatever i am going to deliver under this heading that we being in living cells living organisms how we evolved that will be the first part what happened what were the various revolutions and where we are heading towards again uh, it is thought provoking there are many references which i have already referred and i have tried to compile all those things to make it more interactive presentation as well as thought provoking at the end we need to think and decide it may be struggle for existence it might be question mark it might be full stop survival forever again a question mark might be full stop and then so and so but we have witnessed we are witnessing that what is happening in last 1500 years or 200 years maybe so the most important thing is all about debate all about understanding all about our future and it's not about only future of humans it's about whole ecosystem so coming back to formation of earth as it is seen in this particular slide 4.5 billion years ago it is uh, assumed that earth was formed around 3.78 billion years ago there are proof we have certain uh, justified documentation that uh, on the basis of fossils and many other things where scientific investigation takes place that first the microorganism was evolved then uh, cyanobacterial microfossils that is oxygenic oxygen was not there earlier the life on this earth was anaerobic no free oxygen was available and oxygen when it came into the atmosphere many species were killed because oxygen as such is believed to be toxic slowly and steadily the formation of during the formation of oxygen atmosphere the few species began to adapt that new environment they nullified the toxicity of oxygen and today what we call those organism as an aerobic organisms so it happened around 1.5 to 2 billion years ago formation of oxygen in the atmosphere and then all other species came we came very late mammals so this is a, a brief timeline to get into the subject and uh, i need to justify living organisms and then how everything is integrated justifying biotechnology what is the importance of biotechnology why biotechnology uh, how it can help apart from that the another important question will it damage is it dangerous if it is not controlled what will be our future where we will be going what will happen to the normal climate of this mother earth where we are staying it is our habitat but we have witnessed that lot of damage because of climatic change because of the activities of the humans especially we have witnessed that dangers 
are there. So we'll try to understand that. So this is just a brief timeline uh, regarding how first things happen before the living system get because finally it's all about the uh, living organisms. So 13.5 billion years matter and energy appeared, beginning of physics, atoms and molecules, beginning of chemistry. So that was the first part. 4.5 billion years, I already told you uh, the formation of planet Earth. 3.5 3.8 billion emergence. It is believed of an organism. Obviously, it was first microorganism, a single celled life, beginning of biology, we can say. This is very important. Uh, six million, before six million, last common grandmother of humans and chimpanzees was noted. So, this has been taken from the reference book published with an ISBN number, uh, which I will share you at the end of my presentation. 2.5 million evolution of genus Homo in Africa. And these are the uh, proofs which we got related to that. 2 million years humans spread from Africa to Eurasia, evolution of different human species. Then 500,000 years, Neanderthals evolved in Europe and Middle East. 300,000 years before daily use of fire and 2,000, 200,000 years Homo sapiens, Homo sapiens, the intelligent humans evolved in East Africa. This is how we have been evolved. Now I'll try to reflect that what happened earlier in a, in a very uh, uh, simplified way, a presentation where you can see that uh, uh, how we have considered ourselves intelligent, but how it happened and that was because of our capacity of the brain, what we call it as CC or cranial capacity, we come to that point. So this clearly shows that uh, uh, what is happening around the, uh, during uh, 1 million years ago, what we were, we were the other animals lunch they used to kill us other higher animals 700,000 years ago uh, fire was invented by humans and there came a very important uh, revolution what we call it as uh, cognitive revolution at around 70,000 years. So between 100,000 years ago, it is it is known that we made tools to defend ourselves. Uh, so survival, I, I hope you are well aware regarding uh, if fundamental biologist might be there. Uh, struggle for existence and survival for the fittest. So uh, finally, each and every living uh, organism struggles for existence, they need to survive, they need to reproduce. These are all basic uh, fundamental biological common properties exhibited by each and every, they communicate, they do communicate, each and every living organisms communicate. So 70,000 years ago, cognitive revolution was there and now just check it out. This is the size of brain from 500 cc to 800 to 1150 to around 1400 cc. At the end of uh, between 70,000 years and 12,000 years, which has been shown here, agricultural revolution happened. So from cognitive revolution to agricultural revolution. Now, these humans were before agricultural revolution were foragers. Foragers are those, they, they were believed to be foragers. They are those person uh, who search for food, for survival. We are well aware of it. It is very much essential. Even animals, we have domesticated animals right now. We observe everything. It might be insects. Any living form needs nutrients to survive, food to survive. So we were foragers. We used to roam around, try to identify it. it was there were many dangers also related to that but somehow we survived right we begin to identify that which one is good for us which one is poisonous something like that it might have happened 
I'm talking about before agriculture revolution. But our ancestor during that time means I'm talking about now this agricultural revolution. Those ancestors domesticated certain crops. That is what we call it as agriculture revolution. And it approximately uh, uh, happened. That is uh, that is now this this timeline, this point which I am talking about. See the word limited nutrition is written. Now, what does it indicate? Those ancestors after cognitive revolution, that is around uh, 9500 or 3500 BC, they domesticated only certain type of food grains or cereals, maybe wheat, rice, maize, potato, millets, and barley, maybe. Even today, just, just before 9,500 to 3,500, even today, 90% of our calories, whatever the food we eat, comes from this only. Means no further domestication happened. And that what I feel after reading many references that many of might disagree, many of might agree also. That's why I told everything what I'm going to present is thought provoking. We, we limited our nutritional sources. We limited our nutrients. So now again question mark come that whether this was necessary or it, it was the wrong thing, I think. Everyone has to decide. So the free now he is captive. As such, we, we normally we normally say in our uh, actually you need to think in other way around. Not wheat was domesticated. Wheat domesticated humans. The humans who was free. They, 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 they tried different variety for survival in, in the ecosystem where they survived. Now they localize to a particular area only. They become captive. The word domus, Latin means house, domesticated. It comes from the word domus, which is Latin, which is house. Who is living in house? Not wheat. Humans are living in the house, taking care of wheat field. So what this wheat did to us in agricultural revolution? Lot many varieties what we were eating for our survival, for our good health, then lot of hard work was there. In that case, roaming around in the jungle, taking care of us and taking variety of sources to get a balanced food. We were restricted to cereals. No doubt they are good in nutrients up to certain extent, but they lack certain vitamins and other important ingredients. Not only that, the life of farmers, which many authors believe today also was more difficult and less satisfying as compared to foreigners. Why? Because they firmly believe that wheat domesticated us, not we domesticated wheat. So what was our job now? Our job was to clear rocks, make it more fertile land because we now need more grains. Once we started cultivating, we became more and more greedy. Carrying water buckets and feeding them. So wheat didn't like rocks. They will not grow properly. So what, what is the first thing we need to do for wheat? We need to clear rocks. Then wheat didn't like sharing a space. So other weeds and other plants are to be removed to clear that particular field. So everything which is available for the wheat, wheat will grow properly. If wheat gets sick by some blight or some disease, then we need to take care. We need to, we need to understand. We understand because of our cranial capacity, see, 1400 cc in agricultural revolution if they were attacked by other animals then we created fences so rabbits and other animals see if they try to eat those grains right we protected it then 
wheat became thirsty. We, we required large amount of water. So we carried, we, we made it sure, we, we, we went for irrigation and we make it sure everything we did for those wheat, those grains, which is which were we found as a source of nutrients or any other grains, rice, maize, whatever it may be uh, during the history. Finally, wheat also needed nourishment. So what we did, we collected manure of other animals and feed it to them. Everything we did, everything those foragers which evolved from farmers, our ancestors, did everything to cultivate that. And we became more and more dependent on them. And what was the resultant? We had an issue of spine, knees, neck, slip discs, leading to slip disc, arthritis, and hernias. Everything is proven scientifically and earlier it was not like that because skeletons of those uh, foragers were compared with those skeletons and other things and other remainings and fossils of those humans who became farmer during the process of evolution. It, it started. Then came the era of industrial revolution around 100 years ago. Now we are well aware of it, industrial revolution. There's a modern people Cranial capacity 1450 from 1400 to 1500. Now, this is what we are, modern human, Homo sapiens sapiens. And there's a timeline of future. Now, well, we need to fill this gap now. What, what is going to happen next? And, and that's the uh, what I'm going to, what I'm delivering, what I'm trying to discuss with you all. Everyone is intelligent enough to, to think, and that's why I call it as a thought provoking. This is how it happened in timeline, millions of years. It took time, but then there was a drastically sharp increase in the cranial capacity. These are Homo sapiens sapiens, 1500 cubic centimeter cranial capacity, which is the measure of the internal of the skull of those vertebrates who have brain. Now, and it has been proven, the volume of this cranium is used as a rough indicator of the size of the brain. And this in turn is used as a rough indicator of the potential intelligence of the organisms. Obviously, we have placed ourselves, considering whole ecosystem where there is, where nature has created, nature has given equality, that we are most intelligent, highly intelligent Homo sapiens sapiens. 1500 cubic centimeter cranial capacity. So we move ahead with such types of, um, it has been classified as nine types of intelligence which has been shown. It starts from suppose linguistic, that is word smart, logical, kinesthetic, naturalist, musical, existential, interpersonal, intrapersonal, and visual. This is what defined Homo sapiens sapiens. So as I talked about this revolution, cognitive revolution 70,000 years ago, agricultural revolution 12,000 years ago, and scientific revolution 1500 years ago. Now, if you, if you think, if you try to understand this three revolution, what was the damage created by these three revolutions to the ecosystem was at every level, there was extinction of species. Humans survived. They made a way out. They survived. Not, not many killing were of other animals were done during agricultural revolution because we started dominating the ecosystem. And if we feel that, okay, fine, these are comfortable, these are not harmful, we domesticated animals also. Others who were who were wild, who were who were who, who we could not we could not tame them, were eliminated. So these three revolutions has not only affected humans, it has affected humans also. If humans agree or not, that is a different part of the story, but it has not only affected humans, but also other living forms too. And there has been data where many species extinct. The consequences what we are facing right now is 
is because of the activities, because of the scientific revolutions without sustainable approach. Now we are thinking about sustainable approach, no doubt, because it's all it's it's all about our existence. What what is going to happen? What next? During this 500 years, this happened and we have we are all witnessing this revolution. So what was given to us during the process of evolution when life was formed 4.5 billion years ago, we created this. We placed ourselves on this top of the pyramid, dominating all other life forms and disturbing the ecosystem. I'm not blaming. This is what which is which has happened. We need to accept it at a certain level. And how it happened? It was because of our ego. Our ego has placed humans at the top of the pyramid. Here also it has been shown a gender bias, right? Actually, both should be at the equal position. This is what nature has given. Each and every life is dependent on each other. There should be some balance. And once you disturb the balance, we are facing the consequences. We all are aware of it. So there comes because of this cranial capacity, industrial revolution, and now biotechnology, what we call it as a clever science of biology. Because I need to integrate that what actually happened, what is it? So humans, as they are believed to have evolved curious because of cranial capacity, we have seen. Individuals who were motivated to learn about their surrounding, sur surroundings were likely to survive and reproduce better than those less curious other living forms. And in this way, we dominated. We become dominant. We we, we dominated all other organisms and came ahead. Biotechnology, that is the manipulation of living system. We did it. We, we did right from the beginning itself. We did it. Enables us to defeat death. But it simultaneously turns humans into unprecedented threat. That is what I'm going to talk about. So the same tools that enable doctors to quickly identify and cure new illness in today's era may also be enable armies and terrorists to engineer even more terrible diseases. Humans have suffered a lot after the political system throughout the world was established. Still war is going on. Recently we recovered from the pandemics and war is going on. We are well aware of it. It is therefore likely that major epidemics will continue to endanger humankind in future only if humankind itself creates them. So at this particular point, if this is going to happen, that is a negative part regarding biotechnology is concerned. Manipulating a certain living system or else creating a more potential harmful living organism inside the laboratory and releasing them for political fulfillment. Finally, it is going to affect us. See, this is what happened earlier and what is happening now, right? These are the reasons for human death then and now. Then means earlier, before the industrial revolution, you can call it as present. So earlier it was because of famine. Now, how humans are dying? Because of overeating. Earlier, because this is because I'm, I'm talking about before 200, 300, 500 years, it was plague because it was not known. Microorganisms were not discovered at that time. We were not aware regarding what is happening. No antibiotics, nothing were there. Plague was the, the, the demon, the killer. Now, because of the advancement in medical sciences, pharmaceutical industries and everything, we have, we have so much support, we have so many drugs to take care of us. And now we die because of old age. Earlier, the data shows death were because of war. And now more suicide. Every morning when you read, when you open this paper, right, you will find out two or three cases happening in, in some cities, in some states, in some countries.
so it has been rightly said success breeds ambition and recent achievements are now passing human kind to get itself even more daring goals and what are those daring goals having reduced mortality from starvation disease and violence i think we have no doubt war is still going on but it it is comparatively very less as it is compared with the earlier one right i am not talking about the recent war which has been one year old now right so reduced in mortality from starvation we are not dying for starvation we have we have lot thing to eat as such as of now disease cure is there violence we don't believe in that we have started our objectives to reach and aim through biotechnology and biological engineering overcoming old age and even death what is happening now that i don't want to become old scientists are working in the laboratories they are doing research how i can overcome old age and even i don't want to die means i want to live forever and that is what survival forever are we thinking in that direction yes so to understand this particular concept biotechnology and biological engineering that what currently what what is happening around what we are doing and what new generation is going to do we need to understand multi disciplinary nature of biotechnology where we need the inputs from not only biological science chemical science and engineering science it will be more clear if you understand this same thing in a venn diagram right i hope you recall that so these are the three major circles right this one suppose if we call it as engineering science is circle a biological science is circle b and chemical science is circle c i'm trying to make you aware regarding the more simplified way to understand biotechnology or multidisciplinary nature of biotechnology what actually biotechnology is all about why why there is lot of rush in pursuing in getting specialized skill sets for this one because this has solution if it is in right hand underline this line if it is in right hand this tool this skill set if it is in right hand it can go wrong also if it is not regulated if it is not controlled so a union b that is biological engineering this b circle and c circle b union c is biochemistry and this a union c is chemical engineering a union b union c that is the center part that is biochemistry biological engineering and chemical engineering comprises of biotechnology so this is a multidisciplinary nature of biotechnology and that's the trap what is the trap here a universal statement that human life is the most scarce thing in the universe and not only few people everybody says and and there are thousands of followers of teachers preachers politicians lawyers actors and so and so they say that human life is the most scarce thing in this universe the universal declaration of human rights adopted by un after the second world war states that the right to life is humanity's most fundamental value and now this thing has been taken we feel at some point that this has been taken in a wrong way how if you understand this statement and death clearly violates this right death is a crime against humanity and we ought to wage war total war against it i'm talking about not the i'm talking about even natural death natural death also violate this right the right to life for the humans so what modern human considers modern humans consider death as a technical problem through biotechnology and biological engineering which has a technical solution in other words humans need to be upgraded we have already started doing this last when two decades 20 years we have witnessed all those things that how we can upgrade our self so you have identified and each and every technical problem has some solution we in search through biotechnology through biotechnology or biological engineering how to take this technical solution and this 
three things are responsible. This is the answer to how it can be done, how it can be upgraded. So upgradation has started via this three. Upgradation of humans will follow any of these paths separately. It has already started or in combination. And the mom, number one is biological engineering. That is altering and improving our current bodies through organic means. The second one, which is very important, everything is important as such, cyborg engineering, which I'm, uh, I'm going to talk about more that how we will be in future adding into our body. So first part is organic, second part is non-organic. And which will have engineering of non-organic beings, using non-organic beings to develop human-like artificial intelligence. So now what it is, it is a cold war between natural intelligence, NI and AI, artificial intelligence. Who would win this war? We, we all are witnessing. In last six months, I think all of you are aware that what is, how AI is dominating. What are his pros and cons? We are not going to discuss. It's not part of this, but then again, it is a thought provoking where we are heading towards. So this is bioengineering. Again, a Venn diagram. Uh, life science and majors, other biology majors are the part of this engineering and technology. So, so it is a multidisciplinary. So experts from all different fields, maybe from engineering and technology, physical science and mathematics and life science and biology come together for this biological engineering. And, and, and see, you will you can, you can get it right. So union of this two is civil and environmental engineering. This is biochemistry and oceanography, applied mathematics, computer science, engineering, electrical engineering, and so much things are happening. Lot of R&D is happening. So many universities, scientists are working day in and day out. Finally, to try to find out that how I can survive longer and longer. So it's about beating the death itself. First one, biological engineering. It is an interdisciplinary area focusing on application of engineering principle to analyze biological system and to solve problems in the interfacing of such system. Like plant, animal or microbial with humans, designed machines, structure, processes and instrumentation. The term biological engineering was coined in 1954 at National Institute of Medical Research. And these are the examples of bioengineering artificial hip knees I, I told you earlier also just just recall that what happens when foragers become farmers earlier the skeleton showed that there were no problems related to arthritis or slip disc but as soon as we confined ourselves wheat domesticated us we became farmers and then they were restricted to the specific area only and they were very possessive regarding their possessions problem started and that problem and then to overcome problem there is a nature of human we are very intelligent we have a good cranial capacity right when problem is identified we'll try to find out the solution artificial hips artificial knees and other joints ultrasound mri and other medical imaging techniques using engineered organisms for chemical and pharmaceutical manufacturing this is how we have progressed sometimes i feel that we create a problem and then we try to find out this again thought provoking. The next one. Cyborg engineering, also known as cyborg or cybernetic organisms. This is coined to describe it in 1960 man machine system in which the control mechanisms of the human portions are modified externally by either drugs or some regulated devices so that the being can live in an environment different from the normal one. This is what how it was defined. It was decided in 1960. So for the exogenously extended organizational complex functioning as an integrated homeostasis system, unconsciously we proposed the term cyborg. This was the statement given in 1960. So boundaries of humanness, a true human, 100% organic, are stretched further raising serious ethical questions and we have examples 
It started in 1997 itself. Father of cyborg, Dr. Philip Kennedy, has linked man to machine. The possibilities are fascinating. That is a good pros and frightening. Every coin has two sides. In 1998, Kevin Wavik, what he did? These are his achievements. A project cyborg. He conducted an experiment known as Project Cyborg, where he implanted electrodes in his own nervous system. He used himself as an experimental animal to establish the direct connection between his body and a computer. Another achievement what he did was neural control of robotic arm through the implanted electrodes Wavik was able to remotely control a robotic arm using his neural signals showcasing the potential for humans to manipulate external objects using their thoughts using their thoughts just imagine where we have started heading and what we have achieved it to date that is June 2023 sensory feedback Warwick's experimental allowed him to receive sensory feedback from the robotic arm, demonstrating the possibility of restoring or enhancing sensory perception through technology. Brain to brain communication, Warwick connected his nervous system to that of his wife, enabling a form of a direct brain to brain communication. Although limited to a simple signal, this experimental highlight the potential for humans to communicate with each other using brain interfaces. Advancements in assistive technologies, Warwick's work laid the foundation for advancements. All thing happened in 1998 in prosthetic limbs and the other assistive technologies that utilize neural interfaces to enhance human capabilities. And whatever he did became an inspiration for further research. We are in 1998. We started the origin of life 4.5 billion years ago. And we have reached within this 45 minutes of my presentation to all of you in 1998, where Warwick's experiments have inspired and influenced ongoing research on the field of cybernetic organisms, driving advancement in brain computer interface, neural engineering, and integration of humans with technology. So all those points emphasize Warwick's pioneering work in merging human biology with technology, showcasing the potential of enhancing human capabilities and establishing new forms of communication through cybernetic organisms. Another example, 2004, Neil Harbison. His contribution to cybernetic organism is significant because he expanded the possibilities of human perception beyond natural capabilities see now what is happening where we are heading where we are going if it is for betterment it is fine but if it is going to misused it is a trap so he became the world first recognized cyborg in 2004 he developed the iborg an electronic device that allows him to perceive colors as sound frequencies. The device consists of camera which capture colors and convert them into the sound waves transmitted through bone conduction. His contribution expanded human perception beyond natural capabilities, challenging the boundaries what is means to be human. He co-founded the Cyborg Foundation to promote cyborg rights and support others interested in become cyborg. So his work spark conversation about the future of human augmentation with the potential cybernetic organisms. 2005, Jesse Sullivan. He lost his both arm in electrical accident in 2001, underwent targeted muscle re-intervention, that is TMR surgery conducted by doctor and his team TMR involved redirecting the residual nerves from Sullivan's amputated arms to his chest muscles. This allowed Sullivan to control the advanced prosthetic arms through neural signals from his re-innervated muscles. He became one of the world's first successful cyborgs integrating cybernetic technology into his body. 
is demonstrated the potential of for research. Again, we are very much, very much interested in research. Scientists are working. I, I told you earlier also, and then innovations, patents, solving problems, and converting those innovations into a startup and business. But how long it will go if same technology becomes very dangerous? If there are no regulations, if there are no, if there is no ethics, what is going to happen? So his experience helped refine and improve the design and functionality. So Levan's achievements have enhanced the quality of life individuals who have experienced limb loss. It is a good in one part. It's all about humans, humanness, what we call it as, that they equally have right to survive because they there was some fatal accident and they were having problem. Something is to be integrated, maybe non-organic, electrical, and they will move ahead. Another example is Claudia Mitchell. She was former US Army officer, known for being the world's first female amputee to be fitted with the bionic arm. She participated in revolutionizing prosthetics program conducted by John Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. The program utilized nerve muscles grafts to allow Mitchell to control the prosthetic arm using her existing nerves and muscles. The another one is Stellark, also known as Stelios Ecredio. He's an Australian performing artist. He's not a cyborg as such, but he explores the intersection of technology and the human body. His performances incorporate technology into his body to question the limits of the body and its relation with the machines. He, see, he implanted ear, third ear in his hand. Telak has suspended his body from hooks, attached robotic arms to itself, and utilized virtual reality system in his performances. He does not identify it as a traditional, I told you earlier, cyborg, but sees his body as a medium for artistic exploration. His work raises question about the future of humanity, the integration of technology into our bodies, and the potential of enhanced capability through technological augmentation. Neil Nigel Ackland is known for his use of advanced prosthetic, it's 2012 prosthetic technology rather than being a cybernetic organism. So Ackland received the B-Bionic 3 myoelectric prosthetic hand in 2012, which uses myoelectric sensor to detect muscle movements in the residual limb. He showcased the capabilities of this particular prosthetic hand by performing various tasks and demonstrating the control and taxing. He experiences the public demonstration have raised awareness about the advancement in prosthetic technology. His contribution have inspired researchers and engineers to improve the functionality and accessibility of bionic limbs. Its importance is to know that he is not again a cybernetic organism, but a user of advanced prosthetic technology. Another example in 2017 came from Emily Bogard. She has a computer chip implanted in her brain as a means to prevent chronic seizures, making her one of the first human cyborgs, according to Wall Street Journal. During the time, that Bogard went undiagnosed. She suffered hundreds of seizures a day, but now she's fine. So this is in one of the interviews. She said, I was not functioning. I could not recall the day to day events. And every time I had an episode is it was like getting hit in the head with a baseball bat. My memory of it was gone. It was given in reader digest interview by her. Because of this computer chip implanted, life become very easy. Third one is engineering of non-organic being that is using non-organic means to develop human like AI, which I called earlier natural intelligence, which is created by nature and artificial intelligence, which is created by nature's creation. We are the nature's creation. We have created human like artificial intelligence. 
and I, I, I know this is uh, everyone might be aware regarding this particular uh, artificial intelligence. It's like a hot cake since last one year or six months, which is happening with chat GPT dominating everything. There's a brief history of artificial intelligence. We'll not go into detail, but it started in 1943 and in this uh, so-called we can we can call it a just in less than 100 years, right? So this is in 2020, right? GPT-3 was there and then 2023, lot many things is happening. We all are aware of it that what has gone on. So why AI is generating so much excitement and so much worries? Now this is again a thought providing. So before I conclude, these are the few slides which uh, uh, where we are heading towards what this is article of May 6, 2023 itself. Right. So launch in November was a menial movement. It has already started an AI revolution, but it's far from clear what directions AI will take future. So that's what some AI poses risk of extinction. Industry leaders warn. Right. Try to find out these articles and read, get into the details. And then again, as I told you earlier, that it is a thought provoking whether it is survival forever or it is still we are or we are now struggling more so that human race will remain intact, right? This one is in May 2023. We are in June 2023. Neuralink brain implant firm cleared for human trials. We are well aware of it, right? The, 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 the main objective is fine, it is okay. But what if it is misused? What if it is not regulated? Then things will become very dangerous. It will become very messy and it will become very dangerous also. This was by one of my posts. We are well aware regarding so cyborgs. There are many fictional movies. Many of you might have seen. Uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's a scary, right? Uh, in future, we will not be able to identify that in a classroom, right? Two or three individuals are cyborg, cybernetic organisms, right? So this is again my one of my posts from on social media that is with AI doing most of the things, right? Now we need not do those labor because artificial intelligence and robots are taking care of it. We humans need to connect with nature and start thinking creatively and intellectually. Now it is a time to think because and in real sense, right? Because the only work left out for us, which AI can never do, which I, I firmly believe, these are my thoughts that AI will never be able to do this. It looks that it is doing something new creation, but actually it is not there. Artificial intelligence is just, they can't predict as such future. Whatever the data, they are feeded with data, right? And, 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 and they have a huge capability within a short period, within seconds to give you the details which, which humans cannot. But humans have created AI indirectly, right? So at such this, this credit goes to humans itself. But then what you will be doing? So you have now enough free time to think in a very creative way. In another way around, it is a war between evolved natural intelligence versus created artificial intelligence, right? So uh, with that, problems will be there. This is what the future is, how we are going to feed humans. Human population is growing because life has been extended. Lot money treatment is that that is good on one part. But then the agricultural land again, there is now now again, there is an irony. Again, there is a contradictory statement, right? How what type of grains we are going to eat? What would be our survival? If it is survival forever, then what will be the strategy? What type of humans will be? Now, this is the projection, right? So this is very conservative, right? If we control, it would be like this. Otherwise, we are in this particular. This is our trajectory to be very true, right? So we are at around here. This is 2020. We are 2023, somewhere around here, right? We are well aware we have crossed. And what is going to happen this, to this planet Earth if it is go? If it will go at end of this 2100, right? In this particular century, end of this century, right? If it is 15.6 billion, double than what right now they are, humans are. Right? It was 2 billion in 1930, see? And how it has grown to 7.8 billion, around 8 billion in 2020. But if 
16 approximately billion at the end of the century. What is going to happen? Right. We need to choose another planet. That is also we have started thinking over it that how to choose our next planet. Humans need to fan out beyond the earth to ensure that this particular event doesn't wipe out. Right? What is happening right now? Right? Beeper joy. Just past this Gujarat day before yesterday, it was very, very, very scary situation here in the Gujarat itself because uh, it landed. Landfall was yesterday evening. Though the administration, administration, central government and state government tried very hard and uh, it has been reported there is no as such casualty because of this cyclone uh, Bipar Chauvin. But it is going to happen. So what, what next? What we are going to do? So we have started thinking and we have defined many things also. A super habitable planet which would have 50% more mass and 10% more surface area than the Earth. These are the specification and we are working on it right now. I don't know what is going to happen in future, but we need some extra space. We need some something somewhere to settle if this is damaged or there is a drastic damage control because of industrial revolution. What has happened? Whatever the climatic change consequences are there. If we try to, it is very difficult to revert, but we can always we can slow down. So that's all. So uh, this is my final slide. So from uh, Homo habilis to Homo erectus to Homo sapiens, uh, Homo deus, deus means God. Survival forever, again uh, a question mark. These are the references which I have referred to uh, prepare my presentation and you can get it all those things, right? Uh, try to get into details, try to find out, try to think and, and just Think of ecosystem as a whole, not as a humans itself. Thank you very much. Thank you so much sir, for such an enlightening and informative session. Now the participants can unmute if you have any queries or drop your questions in the chat box. I hope there were no technical glitches and uh, glitches and it, it went well. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you. So it's it's on on all of few future of humans future of our ecosystem is in our hand till i get question uh, let me let me speak something about uh, what care what responsibilities we are having as a humans so obviously uh, the most important thing that uh, we are we are used to many things right suppose uh, many have many our generation have complained about the new generation but but fine i am very comfortable with that because they there is a huge generation gap they are uh, they are dealing their own ways um, they are using technology but technology should not use them we should use technology that is what my message to them and it is normal thing this is a human thing that once people get used to certain luxury right uh, they take it for granted and that is what has happened uh, throughout the evolution process and they then when when they take things for granted they begin then they begin to count on it and finally they reach to a particular point where they can't live without it and that is what we call it as addiction so uh, my message to young generations who are the future of this planet earth i'm not talking about country as a human as a human mankind as a race we need to conserve we need to protect our ecosystem don't get addicted with certain things try to use your brain in a very powerful and intellectually way so that you can really contribute and all living system can live in harmony that is my message to all of you thank you very much once again 
to uh, the whole organizing committee i specially thank uh, dr j anbu who is convener and professor and head dr kesha desai mr damodar nayak uh, who are faculty coordinators i also thank moderator shushmita ayn and the uh, most important who gave my introduction sita gaur vice president of pharmacon student club thank you so much uh participants if you have any questions you can just raise your hands or you can unmute and ask your queries yeah very uh, good afternoon to dr gaur uh, this is dr shabbi uh, i am a faculty of this uh faculty of pharmacy yes um it's uh, many thanks to you uh, uh cyborg cybergenetic organism uh of course it's a part of human part machines uh in this uh, we'll go through uh dr kevin warwick amazing steps towards uh, becoming a cyborg it has been really a great explanation uh, related to technology used and i have gone through this morning some of the article uh article which mentioned the brain computer interface and transcranial uh, direct current stimulations uh, the cyborg uh, plays a vital role uh, widely related to the uh, pharmacological and medical technology uh, related to implants artificial kidney artificial stomachs stomach and uh, hip joint system everything um, i have gone through uh, actually i am a preclinical uh, cardiac researcher okay. i am quite uh, interested to establish my research towards the modern technology like cyborg um, related to cardiac research i just wanted to know uh, how can i develop my knowledge and hands on training towards this area it may be a uh, link with application related to medical technology may be close to towards cardiovascular pharmacology since yes. i am passionate about the same uh, kindly suggest uh, the development of hands on training uh, which can be provided uh, by any organization in india or abroad um, whether the financial things are involved in that uh, doesn't matter i just wanted to establish my knowledge is there any organization providing the training of this area i would like to swap towards the modern technology so that uh, you can please advise me uh, so nice of you that is really very good uh, pacemakers are already there you might be aware of it sir but uh, the 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 problem as of now i am not aware that who is going uh, through this particular thing and hands on thing because there are a lot of ethical issues related to that so uh, special type of permissions and it might be the part of project work not because such type of thing cannot be uh, for the masses as a whole that is what i firmly believe that but uh, sure Uh, uh we can keep in touch if i come across certain things i can share with you i can communicate with you because uh, i am reading lot many things about it so sometimes it scares me and sometimes i feel that okay if it is to be used for betterment then that will be the great help so uh, thank you doctor actually uh, since it's ethical issues are uh, involving in that how the governments are supporting for uh, individual projects and other things so it it all depends on the guideline and whatever the work you have initially done right everything is now possible but it will be obviously strictly regulated so you need to just check that uh, uh, you you need to uh, create a team because see uh, and uh, and alone individual cannot do such thing uh, it is a not only it is an interdisciplinary it is a multidisciplinary also so uh, obviously you have lot many ideas uh, humans are such beings that they have many ideas they have lot many uh, things to uh, to do the thing is that you have to build up a team uh, who equally thinks like you and then you have to propose a project with some funding to a funding agency justifying the reasons that why you want to go ahead with this particular thing apart from that 
to get a project individually it is very difficult but if it is multidisciplinary if 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 uh, because screening will be done accordingly if if lot many other experts are there and you are taking care of all those ethical issues rules and regulations then obviously because it is going to be very costly right it is going to be very costly so uh, I, I so what elon musk is doing right now right you are well aware of it you might have been updated knowledge regarding all those aspects so uh, uh, try to propose uh, give proposal submit the proposal and then uh, you may find some way out to get into those things and uh, move ahead with whatever you want to do uh, dr shabi thank you dr gar uh, i will keep touch with you in future sure. thank you Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, hello, doctor. This yes. is Arya here, and I'm a 12th grader. Okay. And actually, AI is my uh, is my passion, and I'm an AI aspirant. I don't think I. I mean, it must be a surprise to you that a young aspirant is attending your program, but were, it was really, really enlightening and illuminating for me. Uh, it was my dream. AI was my passion, and I've always wondered how all this worked and what's all it's about. And this session gave me a clear-cut idea. And thanks to you, it was really, really a nice session, and I got many valuable uh, things from this session. And I have a question, and let's say it's an advice I'm seeking. That is, which program would be most suitable for me uh, in AI? I am not actually the expert in this computer science and informatics to be very true. I'm just reading. I'm trying to gain knowledge as much as I can get because it is an area of my interest. But finally, in generalized, I can I can say you that suppose if you are very clear regarding what you want to do, if you are passionate, right? Anything, anything related to that which makes your aim and objectives clear, you can go ahead with that. There are lot many uh, reputed universities um, you have in your hand that what are the ranking national level ranking state level ranking and what type of programs they do. Right? Once you are clear regarding your aim objectives can be set up and accordingly you can develop those skill set and expertise again. Same thing what I told Dr. Shabi you need to associate. It is a time for association. It is a time for networking and once like minded individuals get together government is always there considering all those positive things right because we are at that particular stage where anything can happen it can drastically change the life for betterment or it can worse i i, I don't know what will be the consequences i i hope you are getting my point alia what i mean to say right yeah so so uh, it, it, it's it's really very good. I'm really very happy that young students, young generations listen to me because I was very reluctant initially to deliver online talk because you, you don't see faces. You are not able to interact. There are no emotions. There is no eye contact and lot many difficulties because see, I, I, I came up from the conventional teaching thing and this digitalization and everything came in last 10 years, 10 decade or, or something like that. So, uh, but still we we have we need to adjust to this generation. Uh, we need to adjust. We need to learn and, and that how we are we are trying to get ahead and we are trying to interact. We, we, we discuss, we give suggestions and my, my only suggestion to all young generation is make use of technology. Don't allow technology. To be used by you, right? It should not use you. You should use technology. Then it is really very good. So my yeah, best yeah, wishes. My, my my best wishes that you and and you can keep in touch. Uh, I I mean most of the I, I use technology to remain connected. I am using it to be very true. I feel like that I am using it. I don't know whether when it will start using me, and that is what we call it as an addiction. So. Uh, be away from the addiction work on artificial intelligence it has a huge opportunity many things will be done comparatively very fast I, I i am very positive about that thing earlier i was reluctant but now what i have seen that it is up to us that how we will go ahead with that everybody will say that it is negative it is going to be dangerous uh, it, it it might uh, affect us but 
at this point after reading so many things after listening to so many uh, important uh, youtube videos and uh, uh, reading books related to and articles which are published in the latest uh, my thinking has changed that we have something which is very unique within us but somehow we should activate that and once we activate that uh, we will be in control nothing will happen to us yeah doctor thank you so much as you told i have uh, i'm just recalling all the points that you have told and the one thing that is stuck on my mind is that you have told there's like a cool I can't, door i can't hear you uh yeah am i audible now am i audible hello uh, am i yes. audible doctor? yes now, now you are only well alia yeah so uh, as you've told i have uh, like recalled all the points that you were saying and one thing that is stuck on my mind is that you have told there's like a cold war happening right and after this yes. uh, session my main aim is that like i have seen many friends of my own getting addicted to all these technologies and letting these technologies use them and now my main aim is that i have to use my intellectual in a very nice man manner and i just want to use technology in a right way which serves people which has like a use which has a meaning so that's all i want and i'll keep in touch with you thank you so much yeah sure yeah i am on linkedin uh, and uh, you can you can just uh, search and uh, we can get connected for uh, the academic and research oriented exchange of thoughts and other things sure doctor thank you so much Thank you all the best. Yeah, thank you. Sushmita madam? Yes sir. Yeah. Any other questions or? I'm just waiting for the participant to ask. Okay. Participants, is there any questions? Okay, thank you everyone for the active participation. I would like to call Mr. Achut to present the vote of thanks. Yeah, good afternoon, one and all. Myself, Achut, director of events of Pan Pharmacon Club from Department Pharmacology, Faculty of Pharmacy. It's my honor and privilege to conclude this session by extending word of thanks. First of all, we are very thankful to the management, Honorable Vice Chancellor Dr. Kuldeep Raina and Pro Vice Chancellor Dr. Karbanda for their continuous encouragement and support in conducting the webinars. On behalf of all the faculty members of Department of Pharmacology, I thank our Dean Professor Dr. S. Bharat for his valuable guidance. I would like to say thanks to our HOD Dr. J. Anbusar for his motivation and guidance. We are really fortunate to have an eminent speaker of today's webinar, Dr. Gaurav Sa, Associate Professor, Department of Pharma Biotechnology, Veer Narbad, South Gujarat University, Surat and Gujarat. In spite of his busy schedule, he agreed to share his knowledge in this webinar. Really, we enjoyed and gained a lot of scientific knowledge, sir. Thank you. We are, married, we are very much thankful for accepting our invitation and taking part of this event. I would like to convey my sincere appreciation to our faculty coordinators of today's event, Dr. Kesha Desai and Mr. Damodar Naik, Department of Faculty Members and PG students for their support and cooperation throughout the process. On behalf of Department of Pharmacology, Faculty of Pharmacy, I profusely thank all the participants for their active participation and support. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Sir? Yes, yes ma'am. Can we share this complete webinar on our YouTube? Yeah, sure, sure. You Thank you my, so much. You have my permission. Thank you. So should I leave now? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Damodar sir. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you.